but we can hope, right? Um, all right, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to go over a couple of GUI examples, all right? Then we're going to talk about something called enumerations. Now, I don't know if we'll get through all this today, so if we don't, you know, we'll, we'll just cut it off. Anyone have any questions before I begin of, of stuff that we have done previously? Okay, let's look at my GUI examples. And maybe the, maybe the computer isn't on. Have to turn on the computer. I feel like, I feel sometimes sitting at this desk like I'm, I'm hosting a talk show, you know. And I've often thought, back when I drank sugary drinks, that I should be endorsed by Mountain Dew. But now that I'm, I'm drinking, trying to be healthier and drinking water, maybe I'll try to get a contract from vitamin, what, no, what is it, smart water. Yeah. So I can, you know. Boy, I'm really not sure how to code this. Let me have a nice drink of smart water, and, and hopefully that will get my brain cells working. And then I can drink it, and, you know, I can debug the code better. Uh, I know 50 Cent is uh, involved, I don't know if he owns it, but the, the triple X vitamin water yeah. was, was originally uh, his, which is actually just a coincidence. That's actually when I drank vitamin water, it was one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah. I think he's involved in smart water. Oh, he could be. They're both made by Glassau, Glasso, so he might be. I did not know that. All right. Wow, that was mighty refreshing. Maybe we could get him to do a guest shot in here. Wouldn't that be awesome? All right. Yeah, you can tell it's the end of the semester. Um, talking nonsense more frequently than I previously did. So let's go and let's look at the GUI examples. Um, what I have is I have examples for, last time I think we went for over an example of a drop down. This time we're going to look at an example for a radio button. And we're also going to look at an example for a scrolling panel. All right. Thank you. All right. All right, what is going on here?
there we go. All right. So let's look at the first example. We'll look at the radio button first. So we'll compile everything just to make sure everything is okay as far as version goes. And let me run the radio button test. So what I have is this. I have a radio button. Option B1, B2, and B3. All right? I pick one. Uh, and it doesn't do anything when I first pick it. This is important to recognize. A lot of examples that students see online talk about putting a listener on the radio button. So as soon as you click on the radio button, it does something. Now, that's OK if that is the functionality you're aiming for. right? That's OK if you want it so that as soon as you click on the button, it goes and does something. Like, I've seen examples where you pick an image. You know, There's a list of images and radio buttons. And when you click on one, it changes the image. All right, that's fine. As soon as you click on it, it changes the image. But like for a lot of the things that we're doing, if you think about it, for creating a pizza, for um, when we do the bank account assignment, you're not going to do something immediately when you click on something. You're going to enter a several fields and then press submit. So we only need, so you don't always need a listener on the radio button, I guess is what I'm telling you. You have to understand the functionality. And do you want to do something immediately when someone clicks on the button versus do you simply want the users to be able to interact with the button, but nothing really happens until they press submit. So most of the, exam, most of the things that we're going to do, you don't really need a listener, just when you press submit, then you want the listener to kick in. So when I press submit here, it tells me that I picked item 2, which the label on item 2 is B2. So the value of 1, the value of B1, and so on. So you imagine you had a pizza, small, medium, and large. When you click on the button to add the pizza, you could get the value and go to it. So let's take a look at this code here. All right, I have all this stuff here. Uh, I have an abstract button I'm, I'm importing, and a J button group and a button group. I'm sorry, a J radio button and a button group. All right, <clears throat> I create three radio buttons. One has a label of B1, one has a label of B2, and one has a label of B3. I also am creating a button group. All right? That's important because we want our radio buttons to work as a unit, right? And what do I mean by that? I mean that the way a radio button really works as a unit is if you pick something, it unpicks everything else so that you only have at any point in time one thing selected. So we want that to work as a group. We want it to work as a unit. So the way you get it to work as a unit is by creating a button group. All right. What I do then is I add all of my buttons to my button group. So I create my radio buttons, one, two, three. I add those to the button group, and then I add the button group. Oh, I'm sorry. And this is a part that's a little confusing. I add all my buttons to the button group, then I add the individual buttons to my panel. OK? Essentially, all the, but the button group is not a visual thing, in other words. All right? The button group is a logical thing. So when I put items together in a button group, that means that these are going to work like radio buttons. They're not going to be necessarily displayed as a unit. 
So I could scatter these, these, these radio buttons all over the place if I wanted to. So I could put some of the radio buttons down below. So it's not the position that makes them a radio button group. It's the fact that they are all assigned to the same radio button, that they're all assigned to the button group. All right? So keep that in mind. There's a difference between how they're grouped logically, what makes them a unit, and how they physically appear on the page. I think we've all seen applications where you've had radio buttons or there's a big space in between them. Like here are your options. Do this or do this. All right. Now, I can test this to see what button is collected, uh, selected two different ways. There's a brute force method. And there is the smart water method. All right? The first one's a brute force method, where I can look at each individual button and see if it was selected. So if RB1 is selected, then I can set the text to 1. If RB2 is selected, I can set the text to number 2. If RB3 is selected, I can set the text to RB3 or to, to three. So this is brute force. As a programmer, anytime you see code that looks the, the same, repeated, or that looks basically the same, but repeated, that's kind of a red flag that it can be done a better way. Because this isn't too bad with three of them. If you did this in a program, I'd probably, I don't know, side eye you a little bit and say, I think you could do it better than that, but I wouldn't be terribly upset. But let's say, for example, there were a dozen radio buttons, and you had an if statement consisting of a dozen things. That wouldn't be too good. All right. So this is a brute force, not the best way to do it. This way, though, is actually a more elegant way to do it. And what this involves is this involves looping through an enumeration of buttons all right And for each button, we're going to look to see if it's selected. Let me indent this more properly. So for each button in the list of buttons in the button group, repeat this as long as there are more elements in the button group. An enumeration allows us to loop through all of them in order. And we get that enumeration by grabbing get elements. Let's look at these functions to have a greater understanding of what they do, because this is a little tricky, I understand. All right, what is a Java enumeration? An object that intermits that can generate a series of elements one at a time. So this is perfect for looping through, right? Successive calls to the next element method returns the next element in the series. So here's our example. We can get a list of elements. We can do this as long as there's more elements. 
And each time through, we can say, give me the next element, give me the next element, give me the next element. So that's what we're doing in our, in our code. We have this enumeration of abstract buttons that is called buttons. We get that by saying BG get elements, button group get elements. Let's look at the button group class. Get elements. What does get elements re return? Looky there, an enumeration of abstract buttons. So if I call BG get elements, I get an enumeration of abstract buttons. And what's that enumeration called? It's called buttons. All right. So what do I do with an enumeration? I loop through it. How many times do I loop through it? I loop through it as long as there's more elements in that enumeration that I haven't seen yet. All right, so I have hit the list of things. So that's what this for loop is. A little bit different structure to the for loop, right? But basically the same. This is what we do at the beginning of the loop. This is what tells us when to end, all right? And there's no increment here because we're not incrementing any variables. All right? So our beginning condition, this is what tells us whether or not we continue. So what do we do? Each time through the loop, we grab the next element. So we grab the next button on the list, and we look to see if it's selected. And if it's selected, we set the text to the text that's on the button. That's why you notice when I run this, the results. My results appear two different ways. Here I've hard-coded one, two, and three. Here I get the text on the button. That's why I see B1, B2, and B3. I could also, well, I could also create a little counter and see what position it is, the zero, the first, the second, the third, and so on, if I wanted to do that. Now, yeah, go ahead. Yes, let's, let's do that here. Let's go through and let's display a message if none of them are selected. All right? So I'm only going to make this change to the brute force method. But I could just as well make the change to this one as well. Think about it. I'm going to set a Boolean for any selected. Are any selected? All right? And to start out, what do you think we're going to initialize it as? We're going to initialize it to false, right? Because, hey, until I see something selected, I'm going to assume none of them are selected. All right? So I do this loop. Where do you think we're going to make a change in this loop? The if statement. What about the if statement? Right. If one of the buttons is selected, that means, OK, I do have a value. So therefore, are any selected? Becomes true. Right? If it's not selected, do I reset it to false? No. Because if the first one is selected, then yeah, I have something selected. Once I set it to true, 
that means that there's something selected. I never would have set it back to false, right? All right. So I assume there's none selected. If I find one selected, I change the flag. And then at the very end of my loop, if are any selected, if not, are any selected, then I'm going to set the text to none chosen. All right? And if we do that, then So I don't pick anything. I click that. I get the none chosen method. They pick something, then I get the value. Okay? Make sense? So this way, of course, is a better way. How can I say that for sure? You know, a lot of times, yeah, I I did I had two ways to do this, and I can make them literally do the exact same thing. All right. I have two different ways of doing this, and I can make them give me the exact same results. They both tell me that B2 was selected. So if they give me the same results, they both give me the same results, how can I say that this way is better? Exactly. What happens when you change it? A lot of times that's our criteria for determining if you have two different ways to solve something, which one's better? Ask yourself, what if something changes? What if I add another radio button here? So I add button four here. All right, if I add button four, If I add button four, the second solution still works. The first solution doesn't. All right? So there's less I have to change if I add a new button with the second solution. And therefore, it's a better way to do it. Uh, that, that is like the criteria that we use. That, well, let me rephrase that. That's one of the main criteria that we use. Fault tolerance, what happens if something goes wrong? That's another criteria. The user friendliness of, of the application and so on. But to a large degree, our criteria for better code is how easy is it to change. Because we know that we're going to have to change our software. We just know it. That's a fact of life. So therefore, if we can make it easy to change, then we're going to be ahead. All right. There's a graph. I draw this graph usually a few times a semester in different programming classes. And the graph looks like this. The further
further along the stage that you go, the more expensive the cost it to, is to change something. So early in the stage when you are planning it, when you are coding it, when you are testing it, and then finally when it's implemented, the further along the stage you find something that you need to change, the less expensive it's going to be to change it. Or rather, the more expensive the further along you go. And it curves up like this, which means that it increases at an increasing rate. Not only does it increase, but the rate at which it increases increases. So you have a positive curve going up like that. That means that anything we can do in good programming practices is to sort of flatten this out a little bit. Maybe make it a little less deadly to go back and change something at a later date. So anything that we describe as a good programming practice is probably good because it makes it easier to make the changes to. All right? Questions about this? OK. So that's the radio button. The other thing that we have is a scroll panel frame. So I already compiled this, so let me run scroll panel frame, or scroll pane frame, rather. And what this does is this just goes through a loop and adds a series of labels. And notice we can scroll through them. So this adds from 0 to 99. All right. Now, when you do the bank account example, this could be for transactions. When you do the pizza example, this could have been for pizzas. All right. But the idea is, is that we can make it so you can scroll through these things. Let's see how this works. Okay, J frame, J label, J scroll pane, J panel, box layout. All right, let's notice what I do. I create my J frame, I create my J panel. I set the layout. I add a new J a new J scroll pane I add to my main content pane and that pane that scroll pane contains the panel I know this is confusing so let's go through it one step at a time let's draw it This is my J frame. That's the window that the application appears in. I then create a J panel. Because every frame needs a panel inside it. And this panel is going to contain all of my controls. All right. This panel is where I'm going to add my stuff to. Now, if I put that panel in here, then when I get to the end of it, it's not going to scroll. Let me do that. If I were to just take this panel and pop it in the frame, if I get too many things in the panel, it's not going to scroll. So let me prove that to you. So I save this. Whoops. Compile it. Run it. There we go. 
There's still the 100 things in it, but this panel doesn't scroll. Why? Because we just put, we put in the frame a regular old panel, not a scroll panel. So it doesn't scroll. Seems logical, right? OK. So what do we do instead? Instead, we create a scroll panel. And I'll indicate that by putting a scroll bar here. All right? We create a scroll panel. We put our regular panel inside the scroll panel. We put our scroll panel inside the frame. And then we add things to the panel. When we add too many things to the panel, then we're able to scroll. OK? So that's exactly what we do. Create my frame. Create the panel to hold the things. I create, I set my layout. I set my content pane. So the, the, the pane that's in the frame is a scroll panel. I put the, and it's a scroll panel that contains the panel. All right, so I create a scroll panel that contains this regular old panel. I loop through, all right, and I create 100 labels. Each label says hello and adds the number to it. Then I add that to the panel, and that's when I get the panel that scrolls. Question. Yes. Right. Right. The panel contains the panel contains all the stuff. So all the labels get put inside the panel. The panel lives inside the scroll pane. OK? So the panel lives inside the scroll pane. And the scroll pane is put into the frame. That's not the line. This is the line. The scroll pane is put inside the frame. And all the stuff gets put in the panel. And when the panel gets bigger, instead of cutting it off, because it's in the scroll pane, we get the scroll bar to see the rest of the panel. A lot of times students, when they see something like this, they think of having a label that they change, all right, and change the value of the label. We're not changing the value of the label once we create it. We're adding new labels. So if you're going back and you're going to use, the, use this in the pizza example, you'd have a label for each pizza. Every time you created a pizza, you'd create a new label put the information from the pizza in the label, and then add that to the panel. And because the panel is inside a scroll pane, then it becomes scrollable if um, excuse me, if the content gets too big. Questions on this? All right. Last but not least, this is sort of a different kind of enumeration. All right. If we looked at the pizza class, 
that we did a long time ago. All right. If you remember, we had the size as a string. All right. The size of our pizza was a string. And I think we use small, medium, and large. Problem though is what if someone spells one of those wrong? All right. What if someone abbreviates and uses S for small or SM for small? Or types wrong and has three L's in small? Now we saw one thing we could do is one thing that we could do is throw exceptions for that. If they didn't enter in something that's valid, we could throw an exception. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is to use something called an enumeration. All right. And enumeration is similar to how we used enumeration a few minutes ago. It's a list of things. In this case, a list small, medium, and large that defines the valid values that we can give pizza size. So pizza size we define only as three things. Only has three possibilities, small, medium, and large. So if you notice our constructor no longer accepts a string for argument size. It accepts a pizza size. Our if statement no longer tests the string, but tests to see if it's equal to pizza small pizza size medium, or pizza size large. When we create our pizza in our unit test, we create it using the value of the uh, enumeration. In the pizzas, there is an enumeration called pizza size, and we want it to be large. This is an added check to make sure that we can only set things a certain size or a certain value. So let's go and compile and run this. Pizza size is large, has pepperoni is false, costs us ten dollars. The rest of it works the same way. We've just changed it to use an enumeration. Why? Because it's better when there's a list of well-defined options to use an enumeration instead of just allowing any sort of string. It saves a lot of code, right? For one thing. All right, because the other way to do it is we can make it be str a string, but then we have to have validation code and throw an exception. Here, we have to set to one of those values. Those are the only thing, three things that we can try to set the value to. Questions about that? All right. Uh, that's what I wanted to cover for today. All right, so we'll, we started late and we make up for it by ending early, okay? Uh, Wednesday is going to be a work day in lab, give you an opportunity to work on stuff and ask questions and so on. So we'll do that on Wednesday. So don't come to here, come to lab BU 212, I think. All right, we will uh, see you upstairs in lab.